All right, here we are, episode number 712 of Let There Be Talk. Thanks for joining today on a Monday. Hope everybody's doing good. Hope you had a great weekend. What is happening? How are you feeling? Before we get into the show, I just want to give you a quick heads up. There's a lot of headliner shows coming up. I'll be in Utah at Boxcar Comedy. I will be in Colorado Springs at the Funny Pages. And I will be at one of my favorite places on earth, the La Jolla Comedy Store. Uh, three nights there, headline them. And um, Irvine Improv. I have not headlined there in years. So those are all coming up on the website, deandelray.com. Also, a special shout out to all the Patreoners. There's a new bonus episode of Let There Be Talk on Patreon right now. I want to give a shout out to the new Patreoners here. Where are they? Motherfuckers, where are they? I don't know. I don't know. Um, shit. I don't, oh, here it is. Jeff Howell and Brian Dagzuck. Thank you for uh, joining the Patreon. How are you guys? Let's get into the show. Um... If you heard the grail, the grail is back up and going, my other podcast. Uh, I had Josiah Citrin on, who is an amazing chef that owns uh, a restaurant called Melise. And he also has a, uh, a bunch of other restaurants. And he just opened a restaurant on Sunset called Charcoal Sunset, which is steaks and barbecue and stuff. Looking forward to going there and uh, trying that out maybe tomorrow night. But uh, the reason I bring it up is I had him on as a guest on the Grail a couple of days ago. If you didn't know the Grail was back up and going, please uh, subscribe to it and check it out. Uh, we started talking about his new restaurant, which is on Sunset at the 9000 building, which happens to be directly across the street from the Roxy and uh, also the uh, Rainbow, world famous, both of them. And I was talking about how I'm going to see Neil Young on September 20th, which is exactly the 50 year anniversary of the Roxy. Unbelievable. Uh, I've talked about the rainbow. I've talked about the whiskey and the comedy store. 50 years, all of them celebrating the whiskey more actually, but all family owned still. Unbelievable. Troubadour still out there rocking also. These are some amazing, amazing clubs. And it is just mind boggling to think that a rock club is still open and it's been open for 50 years. Any of them, not just one, but a bunch of them on Sunset. They've survived the uh, complete reface face. What is it? The facelift, the makeover or whatever you want to call it of sunset where they've been just plowing down stuff. <clears throat> and I get it. It's a, it's a different era. It is a different era. Uh, some people don't go to rock clubs, but somehow these amazing clubs have survived. And it's funny, the ones that close it's a lot like people that die early in their career and they have that full folklore of, uh, you know, just mystique and glory. Jim Morrison, fuck, you know. But that's a lot like CBGBs. You think about like CBGBs, man. But really, what's insane to me, CBGBs, of course, has uh, mad history. So does the Stone in San Francisco. So does the Roxy, the Whiskey, the Troubadour, all of them. But what's mind-boggling to me is that these rooms survived and are still open and owned by uh, families in the, in the world of Live Nations and, and all of that. Uh, Lou Adler, still the owner of the Roxy. Built out of anger? I love it. I love it when, he, when somebody won't let you in a club. He was having some grief trying to get into the Troubadour. He was uh, managing and producing Carol King, one of my favorites of all time. They gave him some grief at the door. He said, fuck this. I'm going to open my own club. 
reached out to some of the killers like David Geffen, Bill Graham, and uh, other great people, and they uh, created the Roxy. Unbelievable. And the Magliera family, they, they just built this thing and opened it up 50 years ago, September 20th, Neil Young, Three Nights, which uh, becomes the infamous Tonight's the Night kind of, uh, you know, they released the live at the Roxy, but he was basically playing stuff that would uh, later become Tonight's the Night. It was formerly a, a strip club. And that's kind of funny because Neil is uh, riffing in between the songs. Like Candy Bar will be next on stage. And I never knew what that stuff meant on the bootleg all those years. I didn't know it used to be a strip club. And uh, now it all makes sense. So I'm, I, I can't even believe I'm getting to see Neil Young 50 years later play on the anniversary of the Roxy's uh, 50 year birthday. It's gonna be insane. I'll tell you what was even more insane. I signed up on the uh, website to have a chance to buy the tickets, which I never fucking, it never works for me. And boom, a couple of days ago, I get an email, start, start buying now, try buying now. And it was that same old bullshit I always see on the ticket site where you're in the queue and you just see it creeping, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're 10 away or whatever, and it's going across. And, and I go, man, by the time it gets to the end, it's going to be fucking sold out. It holds 500. It only holds 500. Neil Young, everybody wants to see it. And boom, it came up. And I was able to get one. It was crazy money, crazy money. And, uh, but I'll tell you, I can write it off. It's a, it's a benefit, I believe. And it was no way I was going to miss Neil Young at the Roxy. Neil Young being one of my all time fucking favorites. And that run of On the Beach, Tonight's the Night, Zuma, all those dirge records, you know, just masterpieces. Crazy horse back in action. So Lou is, you know, he is just an absolute rock and roll legend. He's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And a lot of people probably don't even know who owns the Roxy. And a lot of people probably have never even been in the Roxy. But in Los Angeles, these clubs are the crown jewel of the music business. They've been pumping the new bands and supporting rock and roll and comedy and metal and blues and R&B and reggae, their entire history, all those rooms. There was something magic about the Roxy to me. The first time I played it, I didn't even get to play it. It was just so, such an insane story. My band, we uh, booked a small uh, tour, uh, you know, up and down the coast of uh, uh, California. And the big, big last show was going to be at the Roxy. We had a tour bus. This guy, Cab Daddy, was helping us out. I was uh, working for him at the Katati Cabaret after the stone closed. I was helping him book that. So he's got the tour bus. We're out touring around. So Southern California, Central California. And we pull up to the Roxy and we're ready to play. We load in, we sound check, we hang on the bus. There's all these people like, who are these? Who's this band we never heard of with a fucking tour bus? But we were like, we're going to come in town big and fucking rock this place. We'll have a bus and people will fucking open their eyes, you know? And, uh, so we're getting ready to go on. It's pouring rain outside. And something happens. The Roxy has a giant neon R that blinks like a, a just does like, looks like kind of like a country Western type of bar neon up on the roof there. Something happens and it fucking shorts out and starts like a, a little electrical fire, just a little like smoke and shit. And that's it, man. 
They clear the room out. They call the fire trucks. And show didn't happen. Show <laughs> didn't happen. We fucking got on that bus and just, fuck. I mean, we had some other shows, but it was just like, wow, we didn't get to play the Roxy. Unbelievable, man. I'll never forget that. What a fucking bummer. Anyway, Lou Adler, man, celebrating the 50th. Everybody has played there. It is unreal. Lou went to uh, London after the first year of the Roxy being open, sees the Rocky Horror Picture Show, signs him for a one-year performance deal. Rocky Horror Picture Show in the Roxy for a year, every night, live. Then that ends, and he fires back up the rock and roll. And after that, everybody and their grandma played there, including one of the most incredible Bruce Springsteen bootlegs and shows ever live at the Roxy after the uh, Born to Run tour. He plays the Forum. He boogies over and does a late night show in the Roxy, something like 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. or something. And it is just a masterpiece show. And I've owned that for years uh, on CD and vinyl every way I could because it's such a great show. Uh, another amazing record that came out of there that I've loved for years was Bob Marley and the Whalers played there and they put out a live record from there. And I've, I've talked about that record and Santana live at the Fillmore. Those two live records are unbelievable. If you have not heard the Bob Marley live at the Ro uh, Roxy, do yourself a favor, man. It is just a masterpiece. The room is magic. The room is beautiful. It's got kind of a cool, uh, off to the left, uh, raised up VIP area. And that's the best spot. You can get in there and kind of see over the heads. There's nothing better than being in the raised VIP area there. Uh, one of the great memories I have is uh, me and uh, my friend Jacob Dillon. Yep, name dropping. We went down to see Big Audio Dynamite. They've got like a crow's nest where the DJ would spin and you could kind of sit in there and look down on the stage perfectly. We went to see Big Audio Dynamite. We were like, yeah, we'll just go for a couple songs and then we'll cut out and go back up to the comedy store. They were blowing our minds so fucking much. We stayed the entire show and hung out all night, man. That's one of my favorite memories there. Also, uh, I've done comedy in there uh, a few times, which was wild. Which, by the way, the night that Neil Young opened the place, Cheech and Chong was the opener. Lou Adler had a label. He signed Cheech and Chong, produced those records. And later, of course, the great Cheech and Chong filmed Up and Smoke, it, uh, part of the, the closing of the movie there, the, the Battle of the Bands, The Rock Fight. We're going to the rock fight. Filmed in the Roxy. Lots of great shit filmed in there. I saw Cheech and Chong in the Roxy, I think like 30 years after that or whatever. They, they hadn't been together for years. I don't even think they were talking. And then they, uh, they get back together and they kick it off with like four nights at the Roxy. And to see Cheech and Chong on stage doing all those classic bits like first gear oh second gear hey man what are you doing oh just crazy that that fifi yeah oh, there's fifi over there hey you got something on your back what is that i think it's a payday <laughs> cheech and chong man one of the reasons i do comedy is because of cheech and chong just a kid going over to my buddy's house Eric and Rex Gibbs and sneaking their stepdad's Cheech and Chong records and putting them on. Oh my God. Just never forget the early days of just hearing guys talk about drugs. You don't even know what they're talking about. Barbiturates, you know, I got some barbiturates and cocaine and, and hashish reefer, man, all of that fucking shit, man. Anyway, uh, the Roxy, I cannot wait to go to this uh, show. Of course, the infamous You Could Be Mine video was shot in there. 
GNR, Terminator video. Unreal, man. The history in that place. And when you're in there, they got some amazing photos. And one of the, my favorite photos in there is from one of my favorite bands ever, The Clash. The Clash played in there. Prince played in there. Uh, you know, Linda Ronstadt, Slayer. It's fucking, that's the key to a crushing club. Just having a massive palette to be able to see stuff like Lou Adler would see. It'd be like, oh, let's get Prince in here. Yeah, I'm talking, you know, before he was famous, just starting to kick off. And, uh, you know, Prince did that club tour. It was like 99 cents. He played the stone back in the day. Um, so, you know, crazy. I was looking at some of the history of the, uh, of the infamous Roxy. Of course, you might see uh, Lou Adler which by the way, he's 89 and he fucking dresses cool as shit. Talk about an inspiration. I always want to look, look good. You know, it's like, you know, people are like, you know, you, they think you get to a certain age, you just got to dress like a dad, just wear like blah, cotton dockers and, you know, loafers and a, a button up shirt or whatever. Ah, fuck that, man. You know, you want to, you want to dress fucking, to feel good. And I, I was looking at this recent photo of Lou Adler. He did an interview for the LA times about the 50th. And he just looked amazing. He's wearing like a badass flannel, some cool frames and a, and a ski hat. I was like, Oh man, that looks like old Dean. That's how I want to look when I'm a, I mean, I look like that now. I look old as fuck. Now I feel old as fuck. I feel old, but then I feel great at the same time. It's fucking weird. Sometimes I'm like, oh, man, I'm old. I've been around forever. Fuck. <laughs> I saw uh, the Bullet Boys put up a video for the love of money. And they were like, a million years ago, we released for the love of money. And I watched it and I remembered, oh, fuck, I was there. And then I see myself in the video and I remembered, you know, I forgot they, you know, I, I, Somebody told me about that like six years ago. I just forget shit. But I was like, oh, yeah, that's right. I was in that video. And if you slow it down, you just see me. I'm like, ah, front row. I drove all the way down because I was friends with the Bullet Boys. We opened for them at the Stone. And they're like, hey, we're shooting a video in a couple of days. Come down. And I went some warehouse in L.A. I, I can't even remember. And uh it started to make me think like, fuck, I've been around forever. <laughs> that was like, I don't know, 1988 or something. So fucking long ago. And I just think about, fuck, I'm still alive. 57, man. But it does, it does feel like a long time ago when I saw that fucking uh, Bullet Boys video. You know, and I just thought I'm still out here in the game. I've had some amazing times and some serious bullshit times. I could do a podcast for five years on the uh, bullshit, <laughs> but I that would be so negative. It was like, I just try to ignore the negativity and just enjoy the good shit, you know? And as I was uh, thinking about that Roxy and the fucking electrical fire and shit, I was like, yeah, we didn't play, but you know what? A great fucking memory a great memory later in your life, maybe a little fucking uh, chapter in the book, you know? Anyway, uh, happy 50th to the Roxy. I'm glad that Lou and his family still own it. Golden Voice uh, books it now. My uh, my buddies over there, Bill Fold. I hit up Bill Fold right away, my buddy Fold. And I said, hey dude, Neil Young. And he goes, yeah, I don't even want to fucking, I don't even want to touch that, dude. You know, sorry, man. <laughs> I was just immediately reached out to the highest I could. And uh, I got lucky, man. I got fucking lucky on the draw. And I'm going to go see Neil Young at the Roxy. I'm going to have a steak across the street at Charcoal. I'm just going to eat a fucking kick-ass steak, go over, and take in Neil Young in a 500-seater. There's nothing better than seeing some of your favorites at these, like, surprise shows or these uh, corporate gigs. 
you know, super, super rare. That's uh, many times I've seen Metallica like that, which by the way, I did get offered a couple of tickets to see Metallica last night at the last minute, but they, uh, not by the band, by somebody else. And they were just like kind of floor seats. Oh, fucking fly in here. God damn it. Fucking flies. Anyway, and I was just like, ah, I can't do it. It, was, it wasn't like Diva Dean, but I was just thinking like, I just can't. I, I was talking about it on the podcast last week. I just can't get into that. A zillion people, $150 to park, and, uh, you know, just insanity. But, you know, I could see, uh, I mean, I'll see Metallica at Power Trip, which is going to be insanity, but that's part of it. You're just out in the desert, maybe a little mushroom, see Tool and Metallica take the big fucking trip. Uh, yeah. Anyway, great weekend of shows. I did some good shows and, uh, at the comedy store. It was, it was cool. I got a, I got a text, um, that, uh, Patrick hit me up, said, Hey, Jack White's in town. Patrick Keeler, drummer, um, great friend. He said, hey, uh, we want to come down, see you do some comedy. You on tonight? I said, yeah, come on down. And about 20 minutes later, I got a text from Jacob Dillon. Hey, I happen to be in town. Are you going on tonight? And immediately I'm like, wait a minute. I think I'm getting fucking punked here or something. This has got to be fucking, this is, this is weird. You know, uh, a, a couple people I haven't heard from in a while. I saw Jacob in New York uh, about, I don't know, seven, eight months ago. But, you know, to get the text from both of them, like or 20 minutes apart, I was like, wow, I hope I, I don't know if some, if they're going to prank me or something. That's what I kept fucking thinking. I don't know why, because it was just so weird. But anyway, uh, Jack Keeler and uh, Jacob came down. It was fucking great. Uh, we had a fucking killer time. And thank God I didn't fucking bomb, you know. Oh my God, that would have been just awful. And also, uh, let's see. Oh, David Swanson came by, the uh, photographer, great photographer. He came with uh, Jack. And uh, that's not a, 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 like, I'm not over here like name dropping or whatever. But it's just amazing when you think about when you're you're doing something, busting your ass and then some, people that you've absolutely respect to the highest level in the music business want to come down and hang out and see you do comedy. That's just, uh, that means the fucking world to me. You know, that means way more to me than anyone in the business, you know, recognizing like, yeah, yeah, you know, we gotta, we gotta work together. You know, like, like the, the artificial business, man, when you actually have some great friends that you fully respect that, means so much more to me than anything else. So uh, thanks for coming down, guys. And uh, what a night, magic night at the fucking store. Uh, I do want to talk a little bit about, I was at the gym and I've been hearing a lot of Eddie Money lately. And I absolutely love Eddie Money. I'm really bummed that I didn't have Eddie Money on the podcast. He passed away. I never got to talk to him. I talked to some great Bay Area, Bay Area musicians over my lifetime. Great Ken had him on. Great. There's these dudes like Eddie Money and Greg Ken that came out of the Bay Area. Huey Lewis, of course, that fucking absolutely exploded. We still love to have him on the show. But they, they, it's funny to think about there's not really a lot of these type of musicians around anymore where they're just kind of like uh, an Eddie Money or a uh, Greg Ken or Huey Lewis. You don't see that type in the biz anymore. Um, you know, I don't even really know how you describe them. They just kind of rock and roll singers, of course, but they had strings and strings of hits and they all came out of the Bay Area. It's just wild. So I'm listening to Eddie Money and I'm thinking back how great Eddie Money, the first like three, four records Eddie Money put out are unbelievable. This guy's like a, 
a former police officer becomes a singer. Bill Graham hooks up with him, gets him a record deal on Columbia, puts out his debut record. Two tickets to paradise explodes. Oh my God. Hold on. He had some fucking, this guy had some hits. First of all, uh, it, Oh, yeah, Night Range is another one of those bands that just hit me in my mind. Two Tickets to Paradise, You Really Got a Hold on Me. Um, and then, uh, oh, baby, hold on. Just killers. Killer, killer first record, 77. Then he, he comes out with the uh, next one, which I really love, Life of the Taking. That title track is unbelievable. And then give me some water. What a tune, man. What a tune. Give me some water. I worked uh, I, I worked uh, for this promoter for, I think it was like 18-hour day on the uh, Life for the Taking Eddie Money show in Petaluma. And it was, no, it was two nights. Uh, Katati Cabaret and Petaluma Civic, I believe. And this dick... I forget his name, Mark something. I think his production company was uh, Aquarius Productions. Mark, I can't remember his last name. He had curly fucking hair. And he hired me and my buddy, I think it was Wettenkamp, Eric Wettenkamp, to, um, you know, do the load in, get there at like eight in the morning, load in, and then work all day and night, then do the load out. So you're basically working like 18 hours and we did it two days straight. And then the guy never fucking paid us. And I'm 57 years old right now. And I'm still angry about that. Just burned us, man. Back when you're, you know, just trying to make some money so you can keep playing rock and roll and eat, get some top ramen six pack of Budweiser in the bottle. And this guy fucking burned us. He's like, hey, I'll have your money on Monday. And then whenever I'd see him, as I became an adult later, he would just dodge me, you know, like I'd see him at the Phoenix Theater or something. He'd just kind of, oh, fuck. Uh. He knew it's crazy to walk around. Instead of just giving the guys the couple hundred bucks, he just walked around with that forever, man. Shady fucking rock promoters that you hear about in the business. I've been pretty lucky most of my life. I didn't deal with a lot of shady rock uh, promoters. I think because I didn't get to that level where they could really start ripping you off. You know, the big high level where they're just, uh, you know, doing all kinds of weird shady shit that you hear about over the years on Let There Be Talk. but. Uh, Man, what a fucking dick. Anyway, any money, man. I would love to have just a career like Eddie Money where you had like six, seven hits. Remember he had that one, be my loving baby. He had that, uh, take me home tonight uh, with Ronnie Spector. He had shaken. The guy fucking dominated MTV for a long time. I would love to have that kind of career. And then later towards the end of his career, he had a uh, like a reality show with his family, The Monies, I think. I never saw it, but uh, really bummed, man, that uh, we lost any money and I couldn't get him on. But great, great, great music. He wrote those songs. I looked it up because I wanted to make sure. I never really... When you're young, you're not even thinking about, hey, who wrote this? Because when you're young, you see somebody playing, you're like, oh, yeah, they got great songs. You're not once going like, did they write them? <laughs> so that becomes later on in your life. You think about that as you're writing tunes and you're like, man, how they write all those great hits? And then you look up a band, you're like, oh, they didn't even fucking write them. These other people wrote them. Desmond Child, you know, Holly Knight, people like that. But uh, Eddie wrote those tunes, man. He wrote all those great fucking hits. And they play them all day long on the radio everywhere. Sirius XM, terrestrial radio, anywhere the FM dial is in the world, they play Eddie Money, man. And I just don't think that he gets enough fucking glory. He, was, he had that uh, kind of a 
explosion again with the uh, TV commercial. What was it for an airline tickets or something? Two tickets to paradise. But um, I feel like, you know, this guy wrote hits, man. He wrote some great songs. I don't even think he's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I'm almost 100% he's not. And fuck, man, these type of guys that were the rock and roll workhorses where they just had five, six hits and toured every year or everywhere, you know, just, you know, keeping the flag of rock and roll going. It's wild, man. And also, I, I wonder how old he was when he first kind of hit it, because he always seemed like an older dude when I was young playing music you're like Eddie money it might have been just how he dressed he wore like the fucking uh the kind of the new wave tie with a, a suit vest and slacks and uh later on in life he had some uh drug problems I'm pretty sure um he you know I think something happened to him I'm not sure but allegedly what I had heard was that he had uh OD'd in a studio or something and it paralyzed part of him. And later, you kind of had that that side talk thing going, like he had a little mini stroke or something. But he fucking made it all the way through. He lived a long time. How old was he when he passed away? Let's look real quick. And money. God, fucking great. Great shit. Passed away 2019. Um, how old was he when he passed away? Fuck, man, what a bummer. He was 70. God damn, that's fucking young. You know? I, that, that shit is scary to me, man. It's like only 70. I'm 57 now. Jesus, man. What a bummer. Get out there and live, people. Get out there and ignore the bullshit. And just fucking have a good time, man, because fuck, you don't know. Eddie Money gone at 70. Great music, man. If you haven't, do not, do not take Eddie Money lightly. Don't think of him as just some kind of whatever. This guy, man, he, he's got the hits and he's got deep tracks, man. That Life for the Taking song is heavy. I dig it. Anyway, a little Eddie Money love today. <laughs> a little Eddie Money love. Oh, man. What else we got for you guys right here? Um, I'm just peeling through my notes here. Oh, fuck, yeah. This came up on my Instagram. Yeah, Rolls-Royce uh, put out a new $32 million car. Did you guys see this? $32 million car. That is fucking, I don't care how much money I make. If I made, say, a billion dollars, I would not drive a $32 million car. It had an AP uh, watch timepiece mounted in the dash that popped out and kind of turned. Look, I can fucking enjoy the lunacy of that luxurious lifestyle and seeing something that incredible uh, being made. But there's just no way I would buy a $32 million car. First of all, talk about Target. You know, you're seeing all these fucking robberies right now going down, which by the way, shout out the White Reaper. God damn it, man. These guys are out on the Weezer tour. They stop at a Chick-fil-A in Vallejo, California. And their sprinter is out there. And while they're eating, they see some guys pull up, break the windows, and steal all their backpacks and luggage. It is fucking getting gnarly out there, man. I don't know how to solve it. Is it going to just go to the Wild West era where you just, you know, people are just getting shot? You see, because they go up to people and they go, hey, man, you're, you're stealing, you're breaking into these cars. And they just fucking ignore and just keep rolling. And, and before you out there go, yeah, that's what you get, fucking California with your fucking politics. Nah, fuck you. It's all over. It's all over America, man. I see Instagram. I see it. Smash and grabs are going everywhere. Uh, car robberies and, and 
man, crazy shit. You got to fucking keep your eyes open out there. People are pumping gas. A car pulls up behind, just opens up their hatch and starts taking all their shit out of there. Fucking crazy, man. I, I feel I feel awful for White Reaper. I love those guys. Great band. They work hard. It just, you know, they just stop playing rock. It's already hard enough. It's just insane. Anyway, to have a $32 million car, can you imagine? People are just, they're going to know. They're like, that's that $32 million car. Let's just follow him home and rob him, you know? It, it, the, the baller days are over. You know, like the hip hop baller era of like, you know, showing off everything you have. That shit is over, man. If you want to uh, survive. I, I was thinking about that TV show, Cribs. Remember that? Where people would invite you over. They would invite the cameras over to show their fucking crib. No way would I do that. Invite someone over to see my uh, one bedroom apartment. And <laughs> no way. Can you imagine? Just, hey, check this out. Basically, let me give you the layout of my place so you can come rob me while I'm out on tour. That is unbelievable. Back in the day, these musicians, they go, hey, check it out. Here's my car collection. And uh, here's my watch collection. And here's my home studio with all my equipment. Now, come on down and steal it. A $32 million car. Also, that's just the one reason I wouldn't buy a $32 million car. The next reason is people are texting, smoking weed. They're not paying attention. They just fucking smash into you out of light or they open their door and door ding your shit. You have to be a level of, uh, you know, your, your wealth has to be the fool. I don't give a fuck. Now, I think these cars are going to go to like Dubai, uh, to these big, big, um, you know, these Saudi princes and all that. Th those type of people that love to uh, buy the most insane watches and cars and everything. And I get it with them because they have absolute fuck you money they might even get one of those and then uh you know have it painted camouflage just to make it look crazy but uh, a 32 million dollar car i don't know man hit me up on the uh instagram and let me know would you buy a 32 million dollar car first of all 32 million I think you could buy all of Detroit for $32 million. <laughs> You know, like, I would be buying nothing but apartment buildings and homes to rent out so I wouldn't have to ever work again. That's the goal. A friend of mine is out in uh, Maine right now, and... Uh, we were talking about, you know, we're we're at that level in our lives where I'm I've turned into my mom, you know, if I win the lottery. And it's like, you know, I've said it before, if you win the lottery, you don't buy a $32 million car, you disappear. You don't ever have to work. You know, you win the lottery, the bullshit is over. And yeah, I've seen the documentary. The people win the lottery and it ruins their life. They spend it all and they're fucking, you know, they're done. But that's just, uh, that's stupidity. $32 million car. No fucking way. No way. But I can, like I said, I can I can recognize the, the incredible craftsmanship of it, man. Immediately when they had the AP watch on the dash, I was like, wow. I sent that to some friends. I was like, look at this. You got an AP watch on the dash. Unbelievable. If I bought one, I would, uh, I was thinking about what color, you know, maybe I would camo it. I love camo. <laughs> I love camo. It's kind of ruined now, you know, in this political climate, camo is kind of ruined, but I love me some camo. 
Jacques Marie Maz dropped a uh, a rare frame. The frames that were they called it fatigue, and they only made twenty five of them. And fuck, man, I wanted it so bad. Sold out instantly. But what a what a cool looking frame. Just a camouflage frame. <laughs> Ridiculous. I love giant, weird, different frames. I love it. Somebody was like commenting on my frames on an Instagram. Quit trying to be so cool, man. Fuck you. Get the fuck off my feed, you fucking asshole. I love big frames. I love, I've always loved it, man. I love big frames. Elton John, I love his crazy frames. I love um, uh, Swifty Lazar. He had the big fucking frames. He's a famous uh, agent. I love Casino, giant frames, Robert De Niro. I love that old, uh, uh, oh, also uh, Uncle June, Sopranos, uh, Run DMC with the Cazelles, all of that. I love the fucking big frames. God, I love frames. I, I, I'm glad my sight's bad because I would never want to be one of those dicks that wore frames when you didn't need them. Remember that era where I was talking about it like that's what's going to get the hearing aid hot is just have some hipsters wear some uh, hearing aids. They don't even need them. They're just cruising around with like grandpa hearing aids. I'm glad I was never that guy that wore the like, glasses with no lenses. Remember those people? You're like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> But I'm glad my eyes are just uh, shitty enough. Not super shitty, but shitty enough to need glasses. <laughs> uh, shout out. Sponsor. Got some sponsors today. Standard and Strange Clothing. I get all my uh, clothing at standardandstrange.com. Give them a uh, ring. Follow them on Instagram for your uh, denim, your boots, your leather needs, everything. And um, tell them I sent you, Neil and Jeremy, 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 Jeremy. they got this fish, Jeremy. <laughs> That's just an inside joke with myself. Anyway, um, standardandstrange.com, Berkeley, New York, and New Mexico. Great, great fucking shops. I'm looking forward to going to the New York shop again when I'm out in New York. I'm doing the uh, Madison Square Garden. If you missed the announcement last week, I'll be opening for Bill Burr in November for the New York Comedy Festival. Madison Square Garden. Unbelievable. Still cannot fucking believe that. I am, uh, I'm never going to be able to uh, take that in. Um, speaking of uh, Standard and Strange, my other sponsor, Banker Guitars. Looking for a boutique guitar? Do yourself a favor and go to bankerguitars.com. Tell Matt I sent you. Follow him on Instagram. This guy is hand-making some of the uh, greatest guitars made in America right now. You can see people like Mastodon playing them, the Rival Sons, Marcus King, uh, Drive-By Truckers. On and on. And it, oh man, he recently just built a, an amazing acoustic that's not for sale, but it was great to see him dive into the acoustic world. Which, by the way, congrats to John Mayer with his brand new uh, Martin. It, it's unbelievable. He has a, a Martin that just came out, it was just announced. It is a, a signature series, it's a silver burst, which I've never seen on an acoustic. Uh, kind of like the uh, Adams Tool guitar, the Les Paul, or the great, late great uh, Chris Cornell. It has that kind of silver burst vibe. And the detail on this acoustic is unbelievable with the abalone inlay and all of the great things I love about Martin. And I bet it sounds fantastic. Martin is just killing it out there. I absolutely love Martin guitars. Uh, I was talking to Scott from Rival Sons about it a couple of days ago. He's getting a Martin made, which is so cool. My favorite is that Joan Baez one. It came out in the 90s, the signature. I think there's 59 of them. And I always wanted one and I never got one. It's the small parlor, parlor, parlor 
guitar with the slot headstock and the tree of life inlay. And, um, you know, I saw one on uh reverb. I think it was 25 grand. I was like, fuck. <laughs> oh, I'll strum that Martin driving down sunset. In my thirty-two million dollar Rolls Royce to go see Neil Young. Tonight's the night. That's what I'm gonna do, man. When I win the lottery, I'm gonna have enough fucking money to just tell everyone to fuck off. <laughs> anyway, I love you guys, and uh, I hope to uh, see you out at the shows. Join the Patreon dot com slash Dean Del Rey. And uh, thank you so much for your uh, your follows and your support. Candles are lit always here. I think that's it. Hold on. Let me make sure. Fuck. Sometimes I fucking forget something. I don't want to do that. One more quick look here. Uh, 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 Yep, that looks like it, guys. I love you. See you later.